Actually, I changed slightly the uh, title. I mean, my subtitle. So, is how is it possible to relate to the study of language contacts? I mean, I will talk about the some kind of atypical uh, features uh, which is found in Chaga, but it's not typical in Eastern Bantu. And uh, just like uh, Hannah's talk, I think uh, I'd like to. Uh, Focus on such kind of uh, not common, uh, typical features of Chaga, and I will uh, consider the possibility that such kind of uh, features are brought about from the contact with non Bantu languages. Well, uh, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on some uh, typical features, as I said. Uh, Chaga compared to typical Eastern Bantu languages, for which so far I don't have any plausible explanation about how these features have emerged. Uh, some of the reasons might be sold to language contacts, but if so, uh, what is clear to me is that it has to have happened long ago or very deep in its diachrony. Um, this is the outline of my speech, my talk, and uh, I will start with so-called pygmy tales uh, told in various parts of Eastern Savannah. I think most of you know about that kind of things. And uh, yeah, I will introduce about that kind of things. And uh, uh, then I will briefly mention a more obvious contact with Maasai people, uh, which uh, leaves some borrowing words, but there seems no direct grammatical inference from their language. And the main discussion of this talk is about atypical structural features found in present Chaga languages. Uh, I will deal with a post nasal. Oh, sorry, um, I will deal with three uh, topics. Uh, one is about post nasal trilling. Is it is, I think, cross linguistically very rare uh, phenomena. And the second one is VO negation is, of course, you know, related to the Hannah's talk, I think. And the last one is final vowel lengthening. It's also a very atypical feature, morphosynthetic feature in Chaga, I think. And I will uh, conclude on the last chapter. And I don't uh, have to introduce uh, where the Chaga is, but the Chaga are also known as Kimanjo Bantu languages as a cover term for including the, uh, because you know, the, there are, uh, I mean, there are Chaga people there, and also Chaga languages are there, but uh, uh, there are also the uh, languages related to Chaga, but uh, spoken by non-Chaga people. So uh, as a cover term, we use Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, and there are about 20 varieties ident identified as Kilimanjaro Bantu, and most of them are subclassified into Three uh, subgroups. One is West Kimanjaro, the second one is Central Kimanjaro, and the last one is Rombo varieties. <coughs> As a prologue, I would like to mention the people called Wako Ningo, uh, who are said to have uh, preoccupied the Kilimanjaro area before the settlement of present Chaga people, uh, as shown in the slide. Uh, Dundas. Uh, he's a senior commissioner of Tanganyika territory uh, between 1921 and 1925. Uh, he mentioned in his book about the history of Chaga that when Chaga people arrived in Kilimanjaro, uh, they only found only the Wakoningo pygmies um, or Wataremba, as they are also called, who Machame drove out. And it is said that they fled, fled uh, westwards. And uh, there is another source written by Thomas Spear. Uh, he's, um, uh, 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 he's a historian. And uh, uh, also, uh, he noted a similar oral tradition that said that Mount Meru lay largely unpopulated until the first Meru arrived in the 17th century and found only isolated groups called Vakoningo, uh, hunter-gatherers living there. Uh, and we know little about the Vakoningo, but similar groups of hunter-gatherers long inhabited the forest, 
forested highlands of East Africa and so being forced to assimilate or to move when farmers, uh, farmers cleared their forest habitat. And also there is a history book written in Swahili, uh, which is relatively recently published. And uh, it also mentions uh, the existence of Wakoningo. Uh, I think it's on the first uh, box. I think Wenyeji wa asili wa lao fahamika wa warijulika na kama Wakoningo wa Wakoningo pia waliitwa watalimba watu hawa hawakuwa na ushirika na wageni wote wale hamia kimanjaro so there's no uh, good relationship with the uh, the people uh, immigrated to kimanjaro and also they are said to have fled to present DLC and they are related to birikimo is i think the swahili word which means a kind of short, uh, small people, uh, or pygmy people currently living in Congo forest. So from these facts, I have long been considering how possible uh, it is to reveal the linguistic trace of Wakoningo or language, uh, which have already been extinguished as a living language. But I now feeling that it's very hard to <laughs> to do so. But anyway, so however, as pointed out in Spear, uh, there are many stories about so called Wabili Kimo, or pygmy people in other parts of East Africa. And according to Walsh, uh, this is a paper which is called Pygmy Tales Tall Stories About Shoal People in East Africa. And uh, in this uh, paper, uh, it said that uh, written records on such uh, short people are found as early as in Earth's, uh, early 19th century, as shown in the slide. Uh, for example, there is a story about Melich, Melik Mungwans or something uh, told by one of the Michigenda group, uh, which is called Waninka, and the name uh, Melik Mungwans uh, can be interpreted as uh, Marimangao. Uh, which is a kind of nickname of Kamba people. Uh, and the uh, Wakoning of Chaga is also mentioned in the paper as firstly recorded by Tap, uh, followingly by Webman, and they relate Wakoningo to the Dogo people, uh, who were also described as a short people in the story they heard in Abyssinia. And there are also Kulimba, uh, in the oral history of the Gogo and uh, Nini, uh, Nini, Nini in the Sandra legend. So there are many more such kind of oral histories. So uh, such a kind of stories are not unusual at all. And more importantly, these stories follow a specific pattern, which is in turn to be seen as an inference by shared sources of people's imagination. Uh, Walsh actually explains that uh, the idea that pygmies were once found throughout East Africa was widely disseminated through uh, the school text, Zaman Impaka Siku Hizi. Have you seen that book? Yeah. Mm, and uh, from the day of long, uh, long ago until now, this book, which was uh, first published in Tanganyika in 1930, in 1930 <coughs> cites the short, uh, short statute people of Chaga and the Kikui tradition among its examples. Uh, the dividing line between uh, fact and fiction is always uh, rarely as solid as we would like to believe, but the Wabili Kimo will always be suitable subject for an expanded Borges book of imaginary beings or something. So it's, we cannot say it's very realistic, right? So these stories may well be interpreted as a re relatively recent innovation of tall stories as a mixture of different pieces of facts and also the imagination with a narrative effect of exaggeration about encounter with the unknown people. So, I actually, so I believe strongly that there is a uh, clear 
contact between Chaga people and their, let's say, pygmy people. But this totally is, I think it's, at least we need to be very careful about uh, the detailed facts about this kind of story. And also, uh, in addition, I should mention the study searching for linguistic traces on the languages currently spoken by the pygmy people, uh, actually, which is done by uh, Kuhn Boston, and also I think there is a uh, presentation by Kuhn and uh, Hitler. And uh, according to Boston and Kunik, unlike Bantu and Khoisan contact, it is very hard to find clear traces or substratum features remained in the uh, present uh, central Bantu languages, uh, possibly in contact with pygmy languages, at least from the viewpoint of phonology and lexicon. Thus, uh, they propose a new approach uh, which focuses on unexpected or atypical uh, structural features uh, uh, or morphosyntactic features in typical uh, uh, yeah, uh, to focus on the unexpected uh, structural feature in typical Bantu languages. So the aim of this talk uh, uh, to present some unique features in Kimanjo Bantu, uh, which are rarely found in other Eastern Bantu languages, and to discuss how possible or impossible uh, to regard these features as a trace of language contact and what is suggested from language contact phenomena occurred in Bantu and non-Bantu contact areas. <coughs> I will just briefly uh, introduce the lexical inference, which is, this is not the central part of this uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, and uh, I would like to mention very briefly on the lexical inference uh, brought by Maasai language. Until it's uh, unlike its ambiguity of contact with Wakoningo people, as I said, there's a clear evidence of the contact between Chaga people and Maasai people. And according to Mua and Purit, it is said that Wameru or Varvara, uh, there are one group of uh, West Kimanjaro people, uh, a sister group of Mashame Chaga, migrated in the area of Mount Meru in mid-17th century when they met and perhaps had a certain relationship with uh, preoccupant Wakonin people. But after that, around the turn of the 19th century, Wameru had a contact with Arusha Maasai, and they, uh, their interrelationship inter continued up to the beginning of the colonial era. At that time, Wameru introduced some social and cultural institutions from them, from the Maasai people, such as age set or ritual of initiation, and as a natural con uh, consequence, a sizable amount of borrowing words were introduced to their language. I mean, this is a very you know, small portion of the uh, borrowing words from Maasai, I and mean, in Kowabi, is uh, the, the word meaning uh, Maasai people itself, and it's from the Maasai in Kwapi. And uh, maybe the last one is uh, more convincing, I think. Um, Elukunya in Maasai, is a, which means head or brain, is uh, uh, introduced to the, into the Rua language, male language. Uh, the, the form is Unduruki, and the meaning is brain. Or something. So there are, um, it's, it's only a, a small portion of uh, words, but there are sizable words of uh, bar, uh, long words from Maasai. And uh, this is what I would like to focus on this um, presentation. Uh, I will deal with three uh, topics. One is a post nasal trilling. Uh, this is a kind of the phonetic training of voiced stops preceded by homoic non-syllabic nasal. I will uh, show you the sound files later. And this post-nasal training is something like or something. I mean, for example, it's a kind of the, you know, uh, yeah, even in the borrowing words, I think, uh, maybe kanda. Uh, a belt uh, can be pronounced as kanra, kanra, I'm not so good. kanra, or something like that. Or and uh, even in the bilabial, bilabial training is possible. So maybe the word amba can be pronounced as ambra, ambra, 
something like that. And this uh, feature is dis distributed in Rombo, at least it is uh, confirmed in Rombo, and also I heard part of Ulu as well. And and uh, distribution distribution in non KB area, I think it's very rare, I think. And the second one is VO negation, I mean the or close final negation. Uh, negation in main clauses marked by very external close final particle. This feature is distributed in all the dialects in Kilimanjaro. Uh, with, of course, there is a kind of exceptions, but uh, basically, uh, this uh, pattern of negation is confirmed in all uh, varieties of Kilimanjaro. But this is relatively not so rare, but it's relatively rare in other Bantu areas, I think. And, uh, and the mm, distribution is uh, something like scattered, but it's especially in zones B, C, and H, which are Kikongo and the forest Bantu languages area. So yeah, but anyway, so I'll uh, talk about this later. And the last one is final vowel lengthening, uh, which is that vowel lengthening as an indication of uh, term notions, especially about past tense of imperfect, uh, imperfective aspect. Uh, and this feature is only uh, attested in Western Whiskey Manjaro, which is Hua and Siha. And also, this is very rare in other Bantu languages. But I found a similar example in Bila that I will mention later, I think. Okay, so I will start with the post nasal trilling. So I first uh, show you the sound file of this one. Can you read that synthesis? I mean, uh, please. Uh, Pay attention to the last uh, word, veandra. Uh, it's uh, pronounced as a post nasal trilling of alveolar. And the second one is akampa, 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 akampa. It's the, the second uh, word, painted red, uh, which is with the pronounced with a bilabial trill. <laughs> Right, yeah, and uh, I think maybe I would do it again. And so the uh, the first one is alveolar trill, and the, the second one is uh, bilabial trill. And the next one. Yeah, so this is a kind of thing, and uh, have you heard about it? It's an draw and an draw. And this, well, uh, there are a few reports on this phenomena in African languages, I think, post-nasal treating. Uh, to my knowledge, it is reported from Basa, uh, but rarely heard from other specific languages. If you know about the information, would you please let me know? Do you have any knowledge about that? Yeah, I, I know there's a couple more languages to do it. So in um, in, uh, Nibel, in mm -hmm. Africa, they, they do it with the LB. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a number of Kikongo varieties mm -hmm. that do it, so that's zone H. Mm -hmm. And there's one that does it only with the alveolar, and there's one that does it both with the alveolar and with the bilabial. Really? But mm -hmm. I'll have to look up the exact names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. And there are also, yeah. I'm not so sure about why, but uh, I think uh, what, we are talk what I'm talking about is that there are many instances that look very similar to Kikongo variety. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Is there any other <laughs> information about that? <laughs> no? Okay, right. So, but yeah, so I, I should, uh, you know, uh, correct that part. Attested in Basa and some Kikongo languages. I mean. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but in, in, at least in Balsa, it is uh, only attested uh, with the 
alveolar sounds. Uh, yeah, and also if we uh, focus on the bilabial trills, I think it's much more uh, uncommon, I think, uh, in terms of Bantu languages and also in uh, the world languages in general. Uh, when it comes to yeah, but we should say this is clearly a rare phenomenon, even from a general typological point of view. According to Madison, there are only two geographical clusters where the languages with bilabial truths are attested. One is in West Bantoit, West Bantoit and Grassfield field Bantu area, and the other is in Western Malayo Polynesia. And in most cases, whether in Bantoid or in Malayo bilabial truths, I mean, this, uh, the sounds are realized as an allophone of voiced bilabial stop in the post-nasal position. So the, the environment uh, where the bi bilabial uh, trilling is uh, occurs is the same, basically the same throughout the two different zones of languages. However, it is of course clear that there is no direct relationship between Chaga and Western Bantoids, and thus it is very hard to assume any substratum effect for the presence of this phenomenon in Chaga. So it's very hard to explain the existence, the presence of this uh, phenomena uh, by, way of, by way of language contact, I think. Okay, the second one, second point to be discussed is verb object negation word order, uh, which uh, was also a topic of Hannah's talk. And uh, yeah, but more precisely saying that uh, the order is the uh, structural type of the O language with a close final negation marker as shown in the example from uh, Adam Walbanian language, I think it's Bayakaka, you know, means we don't know. I mean, the, uh, the last one is a negation marker, and the verb is, uh, this is a verb initial, uh, the sentence starting with verb, and there is an object noun phrase, we don't, and the negation is put in the end of the sentence. And exactly the same structure is common throughout Kilimanjaro Band 2, as in the examples from Lombo. Right, so uh, the first one is an um, affirmative sentence, she fell down nearly one. But the second one is a ne negative sentence, she didn't fall down. The final element is a negation marker. And uh, I think I, uh, I should uh, mention that in the negative sentence, uh, the focus marker is dropped. Right, so uh, the cardinal affirmative sentence starts with the focus marker, but uh, the neg uh, negative sentence, uh, in the negative sentence, the focus marker uh, dropped. And the second uh, one, they didn't, that's basically the same thing, and the uh, last one, yeah, is, uh, shows that, you know, the, neg uh, the particle, negative particle is not post-verbal thing, but it's a close final element. Dui and the, Dui and the Baruak, Dui and Mm, so it's not possible to say dui andika ku barwa, it's not. So dui andika barwa, so this is the ku is close final uh, particle. This pattern is relatively rare in the Eastern Bantu languages where main clause negation is achieved uh, through a marker in the pre initial slot, like hatu andiki barwa, or something like that. Ha part is uh, marking the negation. As stated in Dreyer 2009, the VO negation pattern is close linguistically rare, as in the table. Uh, the general tendency in the world's language is that a VO language takes preverbal negation, as shown in the table. However, along with Australia and New Guinean area, the situation in Africa is clearly different in those areas. I mean, in Africa and the Australia New Guinea, VO negation pattern is comparable in number to the unmarked negation VO pattern. And since the distribution of languages with this order uh, clearly clusters in central part of uh, their continent, as in the map, this feature is seen as an aerial typological feature of so-called macro-Sudan belt. However, 
the narrow Ubuntu is at most peripheral in this linguistic area, and actually it cannot be said that the old negation order is a common feature shared in Eastern Bantu. Thus, uh, Goldman mentioned that the old negation order sporadically found in Eastern Bantu may be regarded as developed by a different motivation rather than the shared area feature. Right. So that's why I asked Hannah about this one. So the VO negation in the Sudan Belt and the VO negation in the Bantu may be something different. Uh, yes, and, as, and uh, this is a table of the VO uh, negation languages in Africa. Uh, as shown in this table, uh, some Bantu languages with VO negation order are reported, but neither are they, nor the languages from different genera, are uh, geographical neighbors of Chaga. So it is unrealistic to think that VO negation order in Chaga is at least directly influenced by this aerial typological feature. So the VO negation in Chaga can be approached from a different viewpoint. I'm going to show you a, a perspective from cross-bound to morphosyntax microvariation. According to a cross-bound to survey of <coughs> multiple negation in Bantu by uh, Divos and Overa, there are three main lexical sources of possible negation. Uh, one is locative pronoun, and the second one is possessive or personal pronoun, and the last one is negative answer particle. In most of Chaga languages, the source of close final negation particle can be identified as a locative pronoun, as in Rombo, uh, where ku is clearly identifiable as a shortened form of class 17 demonstrative. I mean, there is uh, Alenda, uh, uh, Arenda ku, arenda ku, is, that means where did he go? So ku, part, this is not a negation particle, but the ku, the same, I mean the segmentary is the same marker. Ku means um, locative meaning. And uh, yeah, and the negative marker ku uh, was derived from the same element. And uh, I put some additional notes uh, that uh, the same thing is applied to most of central Kilimanjaro and uh, eastern part of western Kilimanjaro where the negation particle takes a form of tho which contains, uh, which originates in ku as well plus so-called o of ref uh, reference. So the form tho is derived from ku, plus 70 ku plus o. And uh, however, this uh, locative marking system can be seen as reduced from an original system with a full-fledged grammatical agreement with the subject noun phrase. And an intermediate system is also attested, uh, for example, in Uru, uh, uh, Central, uh, Central Kimanjaro Bantu language. Anyway, the point is that most of Chaga languages takes uh, a VO negation word order and the close final negation particle is mostly derived from a locative pronoun throughout Chaga. As shown in the map, this is from the uh, database of the Bantu morphosyntactic uh, morpho microvariation, uh, which is visualized the data from the Bantu morphosyntax database compi compi compiled by the Leverhulme project of Bantu morphosyntactic variation. This kind of post bubble negation marking is relatively rare in Bantu, and the distribution is rather scattered. I think the green one is the, uh, the language with negative particle, I think. This, and this is the China and these are uh, other languages with a post-verbal negation, I think. So they are very relatively rare, and also they are scattered. <coughs> As I've already mentioned, the most frequent patterns of main clause negation in Bantu is the verb internal strategy, especially with a pre-initial marker, while verb external uh, negation is relatively rare. In the table, out of 57 sample languages, there are only seven languages uh, with a post verbal independence particle as a sole negation marker and there seems no clear tendency of its geographical distribution. Uh, though the presence of Western and the forest or Kikongo languages are slightly salient 
uh, if we expand the scope to the uh, languages with verb external negation in general, and one of such languages, Bira, will be mentioned again in the section of final vowel lengthening. So, and also, yeah, as I said, that you know, uh, there's no clear geographical clusters of languages of with their uh, post vowel negation. But I think, I don't know, I can see that uh, there are relatively many languages of the Kikongo varieties are included, in, at least in the languages with verb external negation. So in that point, you know, Chaga can be seen as a little bit similar uh, features with the Kikongo variety. Apart from the geogra geographical distribution, I would like to mention its functional as aspects of post-verbal negation. As shown in Manyanga, exactly this is from the Kikongo variety. Uh, a post-verbal negation particle often shows a focus marking effect as in the second and the third example. I mean, the first example said that kitu didi maronga the, the first one is, you know, the core part is just the neg negative marker. But the second one uh, says that uh, the meaning is that I have not put the plates on the table. I mean, there is the focus put on the word uh, malonga, and the focus is given by the core marker, right? So core is a negation marker, and as well as the focus, I mean, the, the element with a focus uh, function. And the third one is as well, I have not put the plates on the table. In the last one, last sentence, the focus is put on the table. And uh, yeah, so the focus is given by the core marker. So in Manyanga, uh, the negation marker four uh, has, a, um, has a function of uh, marking focus as well. And uh, while in Chaga, this kind of focus effect is observed slightly different way. In affirmative main verbs, the high tone focus marker ni is assigned by default. Njileo loka. So the first uh, nasal part is uh, actually the focus marker. However, in negative verb forms, it is usually deleted. So the uh, negated, uh, negative form of the verb is chile uh, yeah uh, is that you know it, this form doesn't have the initial focus marker mm. yes and uh, this thus it can be said that the loss of the focus marker is caused by the pre presence of the post-verbal negation particle. And this pivotal relation can be explained by assuming the negation marker itself has a focus marking effect, and in turn, the double, double occurrence of focusing elements violates the well formedness of the sentence structure of the language. Thus, if I'm right in thinking this kind of pivotal relation between focused versus defocused element, is an essential part of the post-verbal negation. Is it possible to think that such an abstract syntactic relation or maybe syntactic framework can be brought by language contact or substratum effect? I think this is the only thing I have to ask. I think that this is the main concern of my research on this kind of thing. Uh, it is, yeah, so I would like to uh, have your comments or, you know, uh, suggestions about this uh, thing. I mean, uh, is it possible to uh, borrow the, such kind of abstract framework, syntactic framework, through the language contact or not? Mm. Yeah, so and I uh, will move on to the last uh, point, uh, which is final vowel lengthening. Uh, the last topic is about final vowel lengthening as a marker of past tense. Uh, this is only attested in Western West Kilimanjaro and not attested in Central Kilimanjaro and Rombo. So that means this is a kind of aerial feature within, uh, within the Chaga languages. 
And at least in Central Kilimanjaro languages, the preverbal term we seems to mark the category as suggested in nurse, through it is not clear in uru. So I mean the the, the final vowel length in uh, marker is found in West Kilimanjaro, and for example in Siha, uh, there is a uh, verb form tileka ba, which means the we hit. This is the active uh, past tense, but. Uh, if you see the stative verb, uh, for example, we saw uh, the in Western Kilimanjaro, uh, it is marked uh, with a final vowel lengthening marker. So uh, the present uh, we see it can be seen as Tony, we see, but the, its past tense can be expressed through the final vowel lengthening like Tony, Tony. So the lengthened part of the vowel marks the past tense of the stated verb. The same thing has happened in uh, Rua as well. Uh, uh, we saw, and uh, we see, again, is tilodie, but the past we saw is tilodie, the last uh, lengthened part uh, indicates the past tense. Uh, yes. <coughs> Yeah, as shown in the example in Siha and Uru, morphologically this marker can be seen as a copied vowel or final vowel, uh, and functionally it can be regarded basically as a past marker of stative verbs. And as shown in this table, the form is also attested, attached to non-vowel predicates as well. So the final uh, vowel lengthening is not occurred with, uh, not only occurred with uh, vowel predicate, but also the non-vowel predicate as well. So, uh, for example, existen existential I am here is something like me for, but I was somewhere is me for, and the defective word like I know is ni shi, and its past form is ni shi, and habitual as well, uh, it's habitual is a little bit, um, not, it's not, not clear, but habitual is, can be, analyzed as uh, a form with final vowel lengthening. Yeah. And uh, so and the, this final vowel lengthening is thus, you know, the function of the marker is to, uh, to mark the past tense of such kind of, I mean, the, the, the past tense form of stative verbs or, in com uh, mm, or imperfective aspects. And when it comes to the past marking in Bantu, uh, it is well known that the common past markers in Bantu include the prefix a and uh, final uh, suffix ile and possible combination of a and ile or maybe the zero prefix. And the least frequent uh, one is so-called the vowel copy suffix, which is shown in that uh, slide. For example, in Comorians, uh, the past uh, tense can be expressed through the uh, copied vowel. I and mean, vowel copy suffix, so si la wa is I came, but if it's uh, the same includes a, a vowel a, uh, the final vowel is also a, a ende is not a, a enda, a ende is a, uh, he or she went, and if it's uh, the stem includes a vowel e, I, the form will be ahimi, not ahima, which means he or she stood up. Tsimono, I saw, or ahulu, he or she bought, or something. Uh, yeah. And this uh, feature is attested in southwestern languages in zones K, R, and part of H, along <coughs> with a sporadic distribution in zone B, and the <coughs> dialects of G40. So this feature is also, this doesn't have clear geographical cluster as well. Though final vowel lengthening is, anyway, but it's, this is a little bit different thing. Uh, and this feature is similar to vowel copy suffix in that it actually copies the pre preceding vowel and denotes the past tense of the predicate, uh, predicate attached to by the marker but it is clearly different from uh, vowel copy in that the marker is sorted in the post-final position. Vowel copy marker is sorted in the, sorted in the final vowel <coughs> position, but uh, uh, vowel lengthening is 
uh, marked uh, in the post-final position. In that sense, there are very few examples equivalent to the vowel lengthening marker in, in Kilimanjaro, but uh, one of such rare examples is actually reported from Bila, uh, which I've already mentioned in the previous part, uh, which is a forest language, and their function is also similar to that in West Kilimanjaro. And Bila, it's very too small, but it's uh, Bila. This is a list of the uh, lang languages spoken by Pygmy people. And Bila is one of, that kind of, uh, one of the, uh, the languages spoken by uh, Pygmy people. And Bila is currently spoken also by Pygmy people, and that's one of the languages which may leave a trace of substratum effect of their language, which has been lost long time ago. But of course, even if we think about another similarity in marked negation pattern, it is far from sufficient at all to make a solid investigation uh, for the relation between the languages, and it is fair to say that it is almost impossible to make any meaningful conclusion due to the lack of data as well as lack of shared knowledge about unexpected features of uh, phylogenetically closely related languages, which would thus make more convincing light to a hidden linguistic past. So it's a rather short presentation, but I will conclude my uh, presentation. It is quite difficult to explain the atypical features in Kilimanjaro Bantu as a trace of language contact with the surrounding, surrounding or maybe pre-existed Bantu or non-Bantu languages. Of course, in the, the lexical inference is clear, but uh, it's very hard to uh, explain the, such kind of atypical features by way of language contact, as long as I uh, as long as my knowledge about the uh, surrounding languages. And uh, sp more specifically, post-nasal twirling, uh, very few examples in the world's languages are found, and its hotspot in Africa is very, very distantly located. So it can not be regarded as a case of language contact or maybe substrate effects. And as for VO negation, while it, while it is regarded as an area feature of macrosudan belt, it is unlikely that VO negation is an area feature of rift or east area. Uh, the, I don't know, it, I can see that, I'm also very sure, but it, it may be possible to say that uh, the VO negation is uh, observed the northern reach of Bantu area. Uh, thus, it is also unlikely that uh, this feature is brought by contact, but it's possible to think that uh, the abstract scheme or framework of focus defocus relation can be brought by contact or sustained as a substratum effect. And also, I'd like to know the existence of such kind of focus defocus framework existed in the Numbantu area or maybe Kshitikbo or something like that. Uh, yeah. And the final vowel lengthening, at least in Bantu, only few languages are reported to have this strategy. And uh, yeah, and also what I have uh, confirmed is that there is a kind of similar uh, strategy is found in Bila. Uh, so I would like to know that is there any structural feature in surrounding non-Bantu languages as well? So my conclusion is not like conclusion, but, but it's something like the questions, right? So I saw this here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daisuke. I was, I guess, uh, brought up for some questions. Any questions or comments? Yes. Um, yeah, I think I'm most convinced, actually, or I find the most interesting example, the post-nasal trilling. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're right, of course, that the way it's distributed in Africa mm. um, doesn't immediately point towards language contact, mm. but it's a strange thing to do. Uh, there are a number of examples, but it's not very common. Yes, exactly. And um, you can link it maybe to the occurrence of bilabial trills mm. uh, without a pre preceding nasal, mm. and then Central Africa mm. uh, is more of a, of a hotspot in mm. that sense. Mm. And, and the link to those Kikunga varieties that do mm. it, that is of course also an area, I mean, speculating very wildly, mm. but it's also an area where 
bigger populations mm. live or at least close by. Mm. But I, I don't want to posit that the bigger pygmy populations of Western Africa and those in the Chaga area mm. are, are spoke related languages. But there is there is more of a link there than you would immediately think on the basis of mm. the map. So I think I think the main thing to do is to find out how uncommon this close nose nasal training mm. really is. Mm. Um, it might be simply not documented well enough. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah, working down the list. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> negation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so uh, well, sorry, you can stay on the bullet point if you want. Okay, yeah. Right, right. So, uh, I have a few, a couple of things to say here. So, um, it doesn't answer your question about contact, but mm. I think cross-linguistic Mm. People think of negation as focal. Yep. I agree. So mm. if you negate something, then you don't typically use the same strategies that you use to mark focus mm. anyway. Mm. So your loss of me yeah. as your focus marker when mm. you have a negative marker would be accounted for. Yeah, it's, it's really, sorry, I mean, it's not a good presentation. I mean, this part is a uh, uh, affirmative form, mm -hmm. and this one is negative form, right? So the, the, the affirmative form has a me uh, critic as a focus marker, but in negative, mar negative form, there's, uh, it's almost impossible to put the uh, focus marker in front of so, so I think that that's expected. Because mm, I think yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Usually, mm. focal markers, mm. whichever they, whatever form they take, are yeah. up there in negative mm. um, forms. So in Rangi, for example, where you have the verb auxiliary order, mm. the negation of all the changes around. Right. So my argument uh, about being focal mm -hmm. is partly motivated by the fact that in negation you can't have that order. Mm. So historically, I would say you couldn't focus negative. Instructions because by being negative, mm. they're already it's already focused. focal. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't need to ask about focus defocus. Mm. More, you if you want to use that terminology at all, mm. negation is a different focus has a different focal status. Right. Anyway, mm. so that accounts for your seeming defocus or your loss. Mm. Um, so I think it fits with your story, but I think it means that you don't need to account for it in terms of right. contact or anything mm, 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 mm. Um, else. And mm. um, the other thing is your table where you have the stuff from the morphosyntactic yep. variation database. Um, this is our fault, really. Um, but I don't know if you want to go back to that slide. Actually. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. So even the one with the map, just because it's also right. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit smaller here. So the bottom one, the dark mm. purple eight, mm. where it says two or more of the strategies above. Yeah. What that means is six or seven mm. plus one, two, more three, above. five. Right. Mm -hmm. So in your eights, ah, you right. also have some. So yes. So yeah. Here, mm. your eights include some sixes and some sevens. Right. Uh, yeah. Actually, so I thought that you know the the value eight only uh, yeah. includes six and seven, but uh -huh, yeah. Right. So it means I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, I think it uh, means either six or seven uh, plus any of them. Right. right. <laughs> and and I only say that because actually it wouldn't be too difficult now to look and see mm. of of your eight mm. which ones also have postverbal mm. negation in. Sorry, post verbal independent negative particles mm. because it might give you an interesting geographic pattern, yeah, or it might not do, but I think it would add strength to your argument to know mm. which of those languages do post verbal negation because I think my yeah. feeling is it's not geographically, yeah, coherent, exactly, yeah, and there is everywhere, no, yeah, I got it, but uh, even though I think uh, we can see that map, right? So this is from the uh, divorce and Overa, yeah. and I think it's, I can. It's, of course, it's not so clear, but you know, almost entirely in the southern part, there is no language with post verbal negation. I think, but this kind of features, uh, you know, uh, distributed mainly the, uh, the western side or maybe Kikongo area, and through the central part and the, the northern. It's northern reach, but it's. Uh, the, some of the mid parts, and also, yeah, there is northern which uh, there's not a very clear belt, but the 
there are some languages uh, with the possible obligations, and this this two units the northern reach of the area. So but this is only a two-way distinction, right? I mean, this is either close final or post. Exactly. Yeah. Close final or post final. Post final. Mm. So in this. Mm. Um, I remember I already told you that uh, Ma A mm -hmm. has uh, final level ranking. Really? Mm. Mm. In the What's the function? Habitual. So. Uh, habitual is, habitual. yeah, it's an other But, but not the, not the uh, final vowel of the indi uh, indicative A, mm. Uh, mm. but also. Uh, the verb which ends with uh, mm. or who uh, can be so, or, or, or. So I, I think mm. it's just a kind of analogy mm. yep. of, uh, from the other. Mm. Mm. I think in new case, I think this analogy because you know the function is habitual, right? Mm -hmm. So it's clear that it's derived from the other. So thing. there are other languages which have such final vowels. I don't know. I mean, here yeah, it's structurally very similar, but mm -hmm. I think the, the not as like past or no. exactly. The, what I'm thinking is something different, but uh, yeah. Mm. And then it, this is only one thing that I was wondering so long time. Mm. How I can analyze it mm. Mm. because parent doesn't help. And also, this kind of thing is that you know inference from the phonological system. I mean, this final, final vowel lengthening is only attested in Western Western Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. and it's not attested in the Central Kilimanjaro because the the phonology of the Central Kilimanjaro. I mean, the, there's no clear phonological difference in the system of phonology in Central Kilimanjaro. It's very hard to uh, differentiate short and long vowel in that languages. So in such languages, it's almost not possible to you know, have such kind of uh, long vowel suffix or something. It's not meaningless, I think. Mm -hmm. mm. So I think in your case, I, I'm not so sure about the phonology of Pare, but if the Pare phonology is not uh, sensitive to the vowel length. Yeah, long vowel. Uh, 